I bring grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I know when we started this service, I asked you to intently listen to the readings. I don't know if you were able to do that, you know, but if you did, I wonder what you heard. Because the readings that were read, honestly, we've, uh, the gospel lesson, the Old Testament, you've heard once in the past year, and the epistle lesson had a phrase in it that I think probably most people heard or resonated with. And it was this, all right, you ready? The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Yeah, many of you probably heard that in the reading. But then others of you that are here may have heard because it touches a personal place in your life. Because the two readings from the Old Testament and from the Gospel lesson were about women in similar circumstances from totally different places. About women who had lost their husbands. And I don't know what you ladies in this room who have lost your, your loved one, if you hear those and what goes through your mind. I know when I read about these people that are in a different life situation than me that, well, we just don't want to be in. I know there's a heart of compassion and care and concern that goes out. It opens our ears, and maybe that's what you heard when you heard about these widowed ladies in their circumstances. See, in the day that Jesus was teaching his disciples, to be a widow was meant that you were going to be cared for by someone else. You would either marry your uh, brother-in-law, your husband's brother, or you would be cared for by uh, your children in your household. And we don't know the story about the woman that Jesus was visiting in so much that she gave everything she had. That's it. That's what we know about her, and the fact that she only had two copper coins is a huge statement. In the Old Testament lesson, we heard about Elijah, and we heard about a woman who was in very dire circumstances. Elijah had been by a brook, and it had dried up. God was feeding him by ravens, and uh, well, God told him to go on, move on, and go to Zarephath. Go to a pagan land. A prophet of God going to a place where the Word of God was not welcome. And what does he do but meet a woman at the entrance to the city and she's out gathering sticks? A woman who probably had no belief in God, at least the God of the Jews. As a matter of fact, whenever Elijah looked at her and said, go and get me something to drink, and she went to do it, And then he says, and bring me some bread in your hand. That's when she looked at him and says, you know, as far as you, as far, I have nothing. And she can attest to it by the Lord your God. (laughs) The Lord your God, not the Lord my God. That's the word she used. As sure as the Lord your God lives, I can't do this. And Elijah then tells her, just do it. The Lord has promised that it'll be okay. She was in dire circumstances. She was going home to cook a final meal for she and her son, and maybe she acted out of compassion because everyone there was in the same circumstance. A drought had ravaged the land. Starvation was probably paramount in certain areas and certainly in her household. But what did she do when Elijah told her to trust in the Lord? She did just that. She trusted. She took that little bit of oil and flour that she had and made a cake and, or, you know, a piece of bread. And, and lo and behold, God continued to provide for her so that her and her household were sustained. Trust. What did we see in this woman? We saw a woman in very dire circumstances who trusted in God and did so sacrificially. She gave to the point that it hurt, you might say. It was all she had. And we see a very same thing happening in the New Testament, in the gospel lesson for today. The interesting thing is Jesus is in the last few days of his life. He is about to be crucified. He knows this. And he chooses as he continues to raise and teach his disciples to sit 
in the court of women, you might call it. It's where the offerings were collected. And there's, there are these trumpet-like collection bins that are made out of metal, and people are dropping their coins in there. And we read that they're just sitting from there watching. <laughs> How would you like it if I walked around and watched when you were putting your offerings in? You know, it would be kind of awkward, right? But maybe this was a practice that people met in some of these rooms. It would be like someone meeting in the narthex, you know, during church or something. And maybe it was a practice What we do know is this, is Jesus was watching intently, and he wasn't just watching what they were putting in, but he was watching the hearts of the people putting their offerings in. And he made a lesson for his disciples, and he said, you know, look at the rich people. Look at them. They're giving a lot of money. And he said, look at that widow woman. She gave more than any of them. And we look at it and say, what? She only put in two small copper coins, but she gave more. Why? Because as Jesus told them, the rich gave out of their abundance, but she gave every last penny that she had. (laughs) It's amazing. We would think that is nuts. That is crazy. But what was she doing? He didn't say, by the way, there was anything wrong with the rich people's offerings. He was just simply saying, look at what she's done because she has given what? Out of trust in her walk with God, out of love for the Lord, and she is giving sacrificially. Look at that woman and we see a picture of perhaps what it means to be a cheerful giver. And you're probably saying, yeah, Pastor, but it doesn't say she was happy. But Jesus was reading her heart. And he was setting her up as an example of what it means to be I don't know, one who trusts in the Lord, one who perhaps even had a joy-filled heart as she did so. I went to a pastor's conference this past week, and uh, there was a presenter there. He was, this is a mouthful, okay? He was a Messianic Jewish Lutheran Church Missouri Synod pastor, okay? In other words, he was raised as a Jew, and then he came to know Jesus as the Christ, the Lord of his life, And then he went to seminary to become a pastor. It's kind of funny because where do you put a Messianic Jewish pastor? Well, they placed him in Kentucky of all places. Go figure. But believe it or not, he had Orthodox Jews. He was building relationships. They're driving in from an hour away. But here's something he shared with us. He said, the scriptures, when we read them, you've got to realize that the Jewish people, these, these letters especially by Paul and, and the Gospels, all these were written by Jews, and they use analogies, and they use things that only an Orthodox Jew would recognize. But here's one thing he said. He said, you've got to understand the law of God for the Orthodox Jew is not a guilt motivation. I thought this was really interesting. They look at the law of God almost as if it is gospel. And it's kind of weird because as good old Lutherans, we know that the law is there to do what? Convict us of our sins. That's one of the things it does. We know we fall short of fulfilling the law of God, but by God's grace, we need a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And we recognize that black and white distinction, you know? But he says it's not as black and white in the Orthodox uh, uh, Jewish traditions because when they're fulfilling the law, this is the word he used, and it's kind of a churchy word, okay? But he said, for them it's sacramental in nature, okay? For them it's sacramental in nature. In other words, a sacrament is something that God is gifting us with. Okay, we look at the Lord's Supper and in baptism. God, we've done nothing to deserve God's grace in these sacraments, but God is pouring over His grace, forgiving our sins, giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit, giving us strength to live in this life and lead us to life everlasting. God is doing all of this, okay? And when He said it's sacramental, He said it's like this. When they do the law things, it's connecting them to God, much like us going to worship and feeling like God maybe has filled our tanks for the week, right? It's a connecting point to God. It's a good thing for them. So when this widow woman was going and giving her offering and giving more than a tithe, by, by, uh, uh, by the way, because she gave 100%, she gave everything she had, she did it out of love and a connectedness to God at work in her life. 
And Jesus pointed to her as an example for his disciples and for you and me as well. Now, if I stood up here and I preached, so this means that all of us need to go cash in all our accounts and bring your money to the church, you would throw me out on the street in a heartbeat, wouldn't you? I mean, that's nuts. What do you think about when you think of people who give up everything for the Lord's work? Typically, we think of nuns or or monks or maybe people who join Christian cults and go into communes or something like that. It's not what Jesus was teaching. Jesus was teaching that God has a heart for you and he wants your heart to be there for God as well and for the expansion of his kingdom. God has given you a precious gift Through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, you are saved. Jesus died for the sins of the world so that we might not have to experience eternal death. And Not only that, he rose from the dead so that you and I might have eternal life. What a blessed gift that is as we recognize the mourning that happens in our lives. We can have a loved one who died last week or 10 or 12 or 20 years ago, and we can still walk in the promise that if they walked in Christ, they are alive today in the eternal realms, and we look forward to the day that we can celebrate with them. What greater gift is there than that? And God, if you want to talk about graciousness and what it means to be a generous God, God gave us his Son. Wow. So our giving is simply a response to his grace at work in our lives. I want to share with you three words in closing. Joyful, intentional, and sacrificial. And the lessons today really put forth for us the sacrificial nature of giving that God puts on some people's hearts. But joyful, man. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Give out of a heart of joy. If you have to give out of guilt or compulsion, as Paul's letter said, then don't do it. If you don't have a heart of joy, don't give. Pray that God would work on your heart, whatever's going on there. Secondly, do it intentionally. This is the practical nature of being a disciple, a disciplined person in the spiritual things we do. It's no different than trying to take and make a practice out of having a daily devotion time or a daily prayer with our family. It's a discipline, and we do those things intentionally, and giving is the same way. Rather than thinking, oh, this is the one time I'm going to go to church in three-month period, so I'll give some money to the church. That's not what we're talking about, my friends. We're talking about being disciplined givers to the kingdom of God so that this message of the gospel might be carried out into the world. Do it intentionally. Make a plan. And then lastly, think about what it means to be a sacrificial giver. It doesn't mean giving till it hurts. I don't know that it hurt either one of those ladies in our text today. Sacrificial giving means that we're giving, once again, with the right heart, And we're giving as God leads us. You know, I'm a big believer in incremental giving. In other words, if you're you're a 2% giver and you think it's too much to go to 10%, then go to 3% or go to 4% or whatever God has put on your heart. We're putting the challenge of the tithe out there because I think it's a beautiful picture of this holy smoke theme and what it means to really be committed and look at God's grace at work in our lives and saying, wow, we're free to give that 10%, we're free to give more, whatever God's put on our heart. And if you're a member here, you are going to get a mailing this week with the cards that Nate uh, told you about in his talk. And if you're not a member here, this message is for you as well. If you've got a church home someplace else and you're visiting, think about what it means in your life and in your church to respond to God's grace and grace and just pray that he would help you know what it means to be joyful, intentional, and sacrificial in your giving. So as you go forth, go with God's blessings. Pray that God would give you a heart towards him because I can promise you his heart is bent towards you. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.